Hi everyone, my name is Gretchen Smith and I work for the Tobacco Education and Prevention Partnership at Boulder County Public Health. Today we'll be going over all things vaping. Our objectives for today are to recognize emerging trends and culture of youth use of electronic nicotine devices, e-cigarettes, and vaping, explore the health effects of electronic nicotine devices and vaping, and to summarize school policies and local community laws for electronic nicotine devices, e-cigarettes, and vaping. There have been some recent changes as a result of the high prevalence of youth vaping rates at the local and federal level, so we'll be going over some of those policies as well. As a note, you will notice that I refer to electronic nicotine devices as e-cigarettes and vapes. I will continue to use these terms interchangeably throughout the presentation. We're going to start out with a little bit of data to frame the problem and to look at what this is really looking like in Boulder County. This data is from the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, which is done every two years in many schools across Colorado. This data is looking specifically at youth rates of tobacco in Boulder County. Here you can see that vaping products are definitely the most popular tobacco product that is used among youth. About 33% of youth are currently using these products in comparison to 8% of youth using cigarettes. Then we have around 10% who are currently using other tobacco products. We classify other tobacco products with things such as cigars, cigarillos, dip, chew, or other non-combustible products. You will notice that this data is from 2017, so it's a little bit old. We will hopefully have data from the 2019 survey very soon, which will give us a better picture of what this currently is looking like in our community. Here you can see that almost half of high school students have ever tried a vaping product, and that's in comparison to 33% that are current users. Again, this data is from 2017, so it may look a little bit differently in your community right now. Here we see that middle school students are also experimenting with tobacco products. Almost 14% have tried a vaping product, while around 5% have tried cigarettes. And our last data slide here is looking at what we call the perception of risk. You can see here that among high school youth, almost 90% reported that they thought that cigarettes are harmful. That is in comparison to just over 50% 50 that thought vaping was harmful. This shows that we have a lot of work to do to make sure that young people understand the health risks behind using these products and that vaping companies have really done a great job of distancing themselves and marketing these products as safer than cigarettes. I think it's important to talk about who may be most likely to be impacted by tobacco use. So here we see that in Colorado, youth who feel unsafe at school, have a mental health concern, do not have a parent or guardian that they trust, are a member of the LGBTQ community, live in a family dealing with economic precarity or experience racism, are more likely to use tobacco or nicotine products. These are what we call risk factors for tobacco use. There are other risk factors as well, but these are what really showed up in our data. Important to understand about these risk factors in the data is that these are societal and structural problems that exist that are causing individuals or communities to be more at risk of using these products. For example, if someone is experiencing racist microaggressions every day, they are dealing with more stress and hardship than someone who doesn't experience that. In addition, we know that our systems, um, there are, they are dealing with inequities in, within our systems, so that adds to the barriers and the stressors in their life as well. We know that many young people turn to substances to deal with stress or whatever else is going on in their lives. It's not the fault of young people who are experiencing these risk factors, but it is up to us to address them 
and to change those inequities within our system. We will also talk in a few minutes about marketing tactics and about how some communities have been intentionally targeted by tobacco products um, and companies and how this has led to more disparities as well. And to end this slide on a little bit of a happier note, a really important protective factor that came up in the data is that youth who feel that they can ask a parent or guardian for help are 31% less likely to vape. This shows that having a trusted adult in their life can really make a difference in their choices and behavior. So what do we know about why so many young people are using vaping products? There are a few reasons that are backed up by data. The first is curiosity. Curiosity is a normal part of development for adolescents, and these new products have really sparked that curiosity among youth. We know that adolescents are wanting to try new things, take some risks, and maybe rebel against the adults in their lives. The second reason young people are vaping are the flavors. Although many teens report that they would never smoke a cigarette or use chew tobacco, the use of flavors makes these devices not seem like a tobacco product. We will talk a little bit later about some new flavor restrictions that have changed as a result of the high rates of use among youth, but we know that this is a main reason that many young people first started and are continuing. And lastly, we know that there's a belief that vaping products are safer than other tobacco products. From the data that we reviewed a few minutes ago, we know that youth view smoking cigarettes as being much more risky than vaping. The marketing and advertising of these products have led many youth and also adults to believe that there is no health risk for using these products, which we know is not true. We are now going to go over some of the current trends and culture around these products. This is really important for us to understand what youth are seeing and why they are using these products at such high numbers. The most recent data available about e-cigarettes brands and flavors is from 2017. The researchers found that there were 460 brands and over 15,000 unique flavors. Electronic nicotine devices are known by many names, such as e-cigs, vape pens, vapes, pods, e-hookahs, and mods. There are many verbs used to describe the act of using an electronic nicotine devices. These are vaping, juuling, ghosting, cloud chasing and someone who is especially skilled at vaping may be referred to as a vape god or goddess. Other words you may be hearing from youth are things like clouds, e-juice, e-liquid, vape juice, and vape shop. Electronic nicotine devices are relatively simple in their makeup. They all have a battery that charges the device and provides energy for its use, a vaporizer that changes the nicotine and other chemicals from a liquid to an aerosol, a cartridge that holds the e-liquid, an indicator light that lets the user know that it is either ready to be used or is being used, and a mouthpiece, of course, for inhaling the e-liquid. Here you can see a variety of different vaping devices. The first generation of e-cigarettes were disposable, single-use devices that looked like traditional tobacco products. Here on the right, you can see this disposable e-cigarette that looks almost like a normal cigarette. On the left, you can see what we call tanks or mods. These are refillable and rechargeable, and there are often thousands of different e-liquids and flavors available. In the middle, you can see some devices that are especially popular with young people. These devices are always ready to go, are usually rechargeable via a USB port, and come with pods or cartridges of e-liquid so you can easily switch out and continue to vape. The Juul falls into this category, which is very popular among youth in Boulder County. I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Juul because this is a product that is very popular among young people. 
Here is a picture of the Jewel starter kit, which includes the device, a charger, and four refill pods. Jewel advertises as the smoking alternative unlike any e-cig or vape. This starter pack is sold at gas stations, convenience stores, and basically anywhere else other tobacco products are sold. The cost without coupons or discounts is $49.95. Important to note here is that each flavor pod is equivalent to one pack of cigarettes or 200 puffs. The cost of four replacement pods is $15.95. Jewels have become so popular that they have their own verb, jeweling. Since the introduction of jewels to the e-cigarette market in 2015, they now control 68% of the market share. Jewels originally came in a variety of flavors such as mango, cool mint, Virginia tobacco, fruit medley, and creme brulee. They also had limited edition flavors such as classic menthol, cool cucumber, and classic tobacco. Off-market compatible nicotine pods can also be used in the Jewel devices and come in many more flavors than this. There are now some flavor restrictions that occurred at the beginning of 2020, which has restricted flavors being sold in devices such as the Jewel. The idea behind these restrictions was to take some flavors off the market for the devices that were most used by young people. We will talk on the next slide on an exception to this rule and why it's not sufficiently stopping young people from using these devices. With recent federal restrictions on flavors, new products are being created and youth are finding new and novel ways around novel ways to get around these restrictions. We will talk about the restrictions in more detail in a few minutes, but one of the exemptions are disposable products. Here is a brand called Puff Bar that looks very similar to Juul, comes in many different flavors, and are disposable so they are allowed to be on the market still. These products retail between $7 and $10. Electronic vaping devices use many of the same advertising tactics as big tobacco companies. They have done a great job of advertising to a new generation of young people. We know that flavors are the main reason that young people report first trying a vaping device. Flavors except menthol are banned in traditional cigarettes, however vaping companies offer many flavors. Social media is a really big avenue for marketing these products. For its product launch in 2015, Juul spent more than $1 million to market the product on the internet. They promoted images that associate Juul with being cool, having fun, relaxation, freedom, and sex appeal. Social media advertising is really smart because companies can promote those ads for specific demographics, such as young people, and us adults will never even see those ads. They have used social media influencers as well and put ads on social media platforms that are most popular among young people. By 2016, which is a year after Juul first came on the market, nearly four out of five middle and high school students saw at least one vaping advertisement. That's more than 20 million youth. As adults, we don't always notice these ads because we aren't looking for them or they're just not showing up on our social media feeds. However, these are really showing up for young people on their social media and being promoted by influencers that they may be following. Let's look at some specific ads for vaping products. There are a couple different strategies that these companies use. Juul's marketing tagline is made for adults to quit smoking, even though they have captured the youth market and made much of their profits from youth use of their devices. If you look at this Juul ad on the top, it is an attractive young lady who does not seem to be trying to quit smoking. This other picture below makes the man look rugged and cool. 
Again, probably not the best image to show that this is a device to help someone quit tobacco. These devices are also marketed as a healthy alternative to smoking cigarettes. In this advertisement on the left, users are encouraged to love their lungs by using a vape device. While vaping devices are technically healthier than cigarettes because they contain less harmful chemicals, this ad conveys that there is no health risk to these products, which we know isn't true. While these devices may be marketed as cessation devices or something to help a tobacco user quit, none of these devices are approved by the FDA as a quit device. There is also a culture around stealth vaping, which we will cover in the next few slides. As I mentioned in the previous slide, there is a culture around vaping devices that includes using these devices in public places, including our schools, homes, movie theaters, and parks, without being seen or anyone knowing that they are being used. This is referred to as stealth vaping. I want to show you what is being marketed to our youth not to raise fear, but to help you be aware of the pressures and culture of these products and our youth. This hoodie looks pretty normal, doesn't it? However, the hoodie string is actually a mouthpiece for a vape product. This company, Vaporware, also makes backpacks and t-shirts and is actually based out of Colorado. This device may not be recognizable as an electronic nicotine device, as it uses a laptop USB port, port to charge and kind of looks like a flashlight. This device is easily concealable in your hand or in a pocket. So even if a young person isn't using a hoodie string or something like that to disguise their vapes, they are still relatively easy to conceal. Many ordinary items are modified to become vaping devices, such as this mint tin, highlighters, car key fobs, and here's another mint tin. I'm showing these images to you not to scare you or make it seem as though all youth are modifying household items, but to let you know that young people may be seeing these things among their school community or online. Now that we know more about the culture and trends with these devices, we are going to learn more about the health effects. An important thing to note about the research is that these products are fairly new, which means that there's a lot that we don't know about the health effects. As we learned earlier, many young people and even adults do not perceive these products as harmful. However, that is not the truth. Even though some devices are advertised as nicotine-free or claim to not have the same dangerous chemicals as other brands, the lack of FDA oversight makes it difficult to know what is actually in these products. Even the devices that say that they don't contain nicotine have been tested and have been found to contain nicotine. So what's actually in the e-liquid? We know that most contain nicotine, there are also many flavorings, some that may contain diacetyl, which can cause serious lung disease when inhaled. You may have heard the term popcorn lung. This refers to the lung disease found in workers from a microwave popcorn factory who inhaled diacetyl. This chemical is FDA approved for ingestion, but not inhalation. There are also things such as propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. These are food additives that help the nicotine inhalation from the e-device mimic the experience of smoking a cigarette, and it really creates a larger vapor cloud. The long-term effects of inhaling these additives is not known. These are just a few examples of additives that are regulated and approved by the FDA for consumption, but when they're put in an e-liquid, we just don't know the effects when they're inhaled. Another myth about these products is that they emit a harmless water vapor, which is not true. The combustion of e-liquid yields an aerosol that contains nicotine, 
fine and ultrafine particles, and heavy metals, including nickel, lead, and tin. Think about the difference between water vapor coming from a humidifier and what comes out of a hairspray bottle. Hairspray is an aerosol. You may not be able to see the hairspray in the air or on objects, but it is definitely leaving something in the air that isn't great for us to breathe in. This is similar to the aerosol that comes out of a vaping device. There are known health impacts from using these products, including impacts to the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, the brain, which we will talk about in depth on the next slide. And additionally, these devices contain lithium ion batteries, and there's a potential for the device to explode and harm the user. Because these devices are so new, we don't know the long-term health effects like we do for cigarettes, but the following are some of the effects that we know happen in the short term. In the respiratory system, vaping can cause asthma, coughing, and lung problems. This is especially common if someone already has a respiratory problem. In the cardiovascular system, nicotine increases heart rate and blood pressure, essentially initiating the fight or flight system. All right, so we know that the brain is still developing until at least the age of 25. Introducing nicotine, which is a highly addictive chemical, to a young developing brain can disrupt the development of the brain circuits that are responsible for attention, learning, mood, and impulse control. Each time a new memory is created or a new skill is learned, stronger connections or synapses are built between brain cells. Young people's brains build synapses faster than adult brains, and nicotine changes the way these synapses are formed. Nicotine copies a neurotransmitter in the brain called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is responsible for things such as attention and control. Nicotine goes into the brain and essentially hijacks the acetylcholine receptors and takes over. The brain thinks that it's being overloaded with acetylcholine, which is actually the nicotine in disguise, and stops making as much of the acetylcholine. From there, more and more nicotine is needed to be taken into the system to replace the acetylcholine, which is not being created. Nicotine can also affect the brain's reward system and cause young people's brain to be more easily addicted to nicotine and other unhealthy substances. All right, so understanding school policy and state law, whether you work in a school or support a young person outside of school, allows you to discuss potential consequences for vaping underage or on school grounds. It also helps prevent delivering conflicting messages about whether young people are allowed to use these products. We're going to go through a few policies that are applicable to Colorado. There are several pieces of legislation in Colorado that guide tobacco-free schools policy and community laws. The first is the Tobacco-Free Schools Law. This piece of legislation prohibits the use of any and all tobacco products on all public school property. The law pertains to students, staff, families, and visitors, and includes before, during, and after school, over the weekends, and during school breaks and vacations. The law extends the prohibition to any facility or vehicle a school owns, rents, or uses. The law states that school districts must adopt policy addressing this law and also must have visible signage notifying the public of these requirements. Products that are approved by the FDA to help quit tobacco or other nicotine products are exempt from this law. This would include things like the nicotine patch and gum. This does not include vaping devices, even though they are often marketed as cessation devices. The second law is the Teen Tobacco Use Prevention Act. This act is also referred to as T-TUPA. This prohibits the possession of any tobacco product by a minor under the age of 18 and in some communities under the age of 21. The act includes language that possession of tobacco products is a non-criminal offense. 
The idea behind this is not to punish young people who have been intentionally marketed to by the tobacco industry, but to take more of an educational approach. Restorative justice and educational programs can be used for these offenses instead. It is important for you all to know that young people are not allowed to possess these products and school staff, parents or guardians or organization staff are allowed to confiscate these products. With youth vaping being an epidemic that was gaining a lot of attention in the news this last summer and fall of 2019, there have been some recent legislative changes. There have been a lot of changes at the local level as well as some at the federal level. We will talk about these changes in the next few slides. First, I wanna talk about some of the policy strategies that have been shown to work and have an evidence base behind them. The first strategy is tobacco retail licensing. Many people don't know that tobacco retailers in Colorado are not required to have a license like those who sell alcohol and marijuana. Licensing retailers is really important because it allows jurisdictions to know where tobacco is being sold and have options for suspension or revocation of a license if businesses fail compliance checks. Currently, tobacco products are being sold in many gas stations, convenience stores, and many other businesses. Without a licensing program, it's difficult for jurisdictions to know where these products are being sold and to enforce any laws that are, that are currently on the books. The second strategy is raising the minimum legal sales age. This was done in many local communities first and eventually occurred at the federal level, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. Raising the sales age for tobacco products is important because we know that many young people are getting access to these products through their friends. When the legal sales age was 18 years old, a senior in high school could easily buy these products and distribute to others. Raising the sales age to 21 makes it at least more difficult for this to happen. Another strategy is increasing the price of tobacco products. We know that many young people are especially susceptible to higher prices and it has been shown to reduce youth use of these products. We know that youth are very attracted to flavor products and it is one of the main reasons that many young people first try these products. Banning flavors in vaping devices and other products is a strategy that has been shown to work to reduce youth use. Important to remember here is that we need to ban flavors in all products, not just vaping devices. If vaping de devices no longer have flavors, youth who are addicted to these products may move to other products, such as cigarillos or chew tobacco that is flavored. Lastly, expanding smoke-free protections goes towards social norming. If young people aren't seeing tobacco products being used in public places, they are less likely to see it as normal. All right, let's get into some local changes. These local changes occurred as a result of community action and concern over high rates of youth vaping in Boulder County. These all occurred over the summer and fall of 2019 before any action was taken at the federal level. As you can see here, City of Boulder increased the minimum legal sales age for all tobacco products to 21 and banned the sale of flavored e-liquids that go in vaping devices. Town of Superior and City of Louisville, Louisville both increased the minimum legal sales age, and City of Lafayette increased the minimum legal sales age and expanded some smoke-free protections in their community. Many local policies passed as a result of the community taking action to protect their young people, as well as concern over a vaping-related lung illness that started occurring in the late summer of 2019. E-Valley, or Electronic Cigarette or Vaping Associated Lung Illness, was in the news almost every day during the fall with new cases and no one really knowing what the cause was. This disease was found to be associated with an additive mostly found in marijuana vaping products, but this is still and was a major concern for nicotine devices at this time. And it really spurred the federal government to take some action on this issue as well. 
At the end of 2019, the federal government raised the minimum legal sales age for all tobacco products to 21 years old. In the beginning of 2020, the FDA put restrictions on some flavored vaping products. They banned flavored for cartridge-based systems like the Juul, with the exception of menthol. Flavors are still available for tanks and mods and disposable products. As we saw earlier with the example of puff bars, young people are finding ways to get around these flavor restrictions and the tobacco and vaping industries are coming out with new products that don't fall under these restrictions as well. There is still a long way to go to ensure that flavored vaping products that are attractive to young people are no longer being sold. Here, I wanna quickly talk through some strategies on how you can talk to the young people in your life about tobacco use and vaping, or really any kind of substance use. Having boundaries and expectations around substance use and talking to the young people in your life about them often can impact their choices and behaviors. The first thing for you to do is to have some reflection time before you have a conversation. How you say something is going to be more important than what you say. So first, reflect on your thoughts on vaping or substance use in general and the goals of the conversation that you want to have. Make sure that you're in a good headspace to have this conversation where you can be open, supportive, and non-judgmental. Second, you can use what we call the OR method to guide the conversation. OR stands for open-ended questions, affirmations, and reflective listening. Open-ended questions are important so that you are actually having a conversation instead of lecturing, lecturing your young person on facts. An example of this would be, instead of do any of your friends jewel, which is of course a yes or no question, try what would you do if one of your friends was vaping? This provides more of a discussion and an opportunity for the young person to think about this question before they answer and talk with you. The A stands for affirmations. We want to make sure that we are affirming youth for their healthy choices or even just being willing to talk to you about this difficult topic. For example, I really appreciate you being willing to talk to me about this. Or if they've expressed that they have decided not to vape, make sure you're affirming that positive decision. And lastly, the R stands for reflective listening. Just like you want the young person that you're having a conversation with to be listening to what you have to say, they need to feel heard as well. Rephrasing, repeating, or reflecting a feeling that's coming up for them will ensure that you know they know that you are listening to what they have to say and are understanding or at least trying to understand their point of view. It can be as simple as, so it sounds like you feel that everyone at your school is vaping. This shows that you are listening to them and may create opportunity for them, them to expand more and have more of a conversation around this. You don't need to offer any solutions, but just allow that space for them to think through things. The last strategy I wanna to touch on is ask, provide, ask. Many young people are not going to wanna to listen to you if you start spitting out facts that you learned from this presentation today. More important than telling young people all the facts is making a connection with them and trying to understand their situation and what they may be going through. Ask, provide, ask allows for you to offer information to them, but also gives them the opportunity to accept or refuse it. You can ask a young person if they'd like to, for example, hear the health effects of vaping and provide that information to them if they say yes. If they say no, don't push it. They know they can come back to you if they want that information in the future, or maybe they just wanna do their own research. If they do want to learn more about a topic that you bring up, make sure that you're providing the facts and then you ask them what they think. Perhaps you just told them that only around 33% of young people regularly vape. Ask what their thoughts are on that statistic and it can open up to more conversation about what they're seeing in their school community or their community at large. Don't forget that having these conversations and setting expectations with young people can really impact their behavior and choices. If you haven't had these conversations with the young people in your life yet, it's never too late to start. Having a trusted adult 
that they feel like they can come to when they're going through a tough time or have a problem is a protective factor and makes it less likely that they will vape. Provide an opportunity opportunity to listen to them, show your support and appreciation of them talking to you. It's okay to set boundaries and st state your expectations of them. I recognize that these are often tough conversations to have with young people. So do your best and it's okay to not have that perfect conversation. You will have more than one opportunity. I want to leave you today with some resources that are available for young people when they are ready to quit vaping or using other tobacco products. These are not recommended for young people if they are caught smoking or vaping. They are really for young people who feel and express that they are ready to quit. My Life My Quit is a program that can be done via phone or web chat and uses motivational interviewing with personalized coaching to help young people quit. Their website also has a lot of information on tobacco and vape products and is very youth friendly if young people are just wanting to seek more information as well. Smoke Free Teen is a really great resource that is, that is catered to young people. You can create a personalized quit plan, get coaching online via phone or their phone app. Their website also has a lot of good information as well and is catered to youth, to veterans, to the LGBTQ plus community, so there's a lot of tailored information. Finally, This Is Quitting was created specifically for young people between the ages of 13 to 24 to help them stop vaping. This is one of the only programs that is specific to vaping. This is all done via text. In this program, youth will get daily motivational texts, and they can also text keywords to get messages or support when they need them. For example, if they're having a craving or some kind of trigger is coming up, they can text for that support. This is a great program for young people who we know are often on their phones and may be more comfortable doing something on their phone or via text than talking to someone on the phone. All of these resources are free and youth can sign up for them on their own if they'd like. Supporting young people on their quit journey is really important and we all need to understand that quitting is a process and may not be linear. Young people may try to quit several times before they are successful and having someone who supports them during this time is really crucial. Thank you so much for watching today and please don't hesitate to email me with any questions that remain. I'm happy to chat and give you any additional resources that you may need. Thank you all so much.